So malaria remains one of the three top killer diseases of the world. It's been like that for several millennia. It's still very widespread. And the question is why? What is it about this parasite that leads to its evolutionary success? And if we knew what led to its evolutionary success, uh, what would we do about that knowledge, using that knowledge uh, when we come to control it? That's the question I want to address in this talk. So the idea, is, as uh, uh, Troy has elaborated, is that there's a trade-off between the pathogen's virulence and its transmission. So the problem for a pathogen is that if it kills its host, uh, um, then it kills its onward transmission. So that's a uh, fitness cost to the parasite. It shouldn't, shouldn't do that. And yet many parasites do that. And the other side of this argument, though, is that a parasite which exploits its host more by taking more resources from the host is one that transmits more. Uh, but the problem is that that parasite will kill its host. So the parasite has to balance this higher level of transmission as a result of exploiting its host more against the potential cost of host death. So that's the trade-off that we're talking about here. And I'm going to show you data which su support the existence of that trade-off for, for the malaria parasite, in, first in the mouse model and then in the human parasite. And my next slide is showing why we care about this, because what would happen if we made those highly exploitative parasites less exploitative by giving those people vaccines? So in, we're turning them from red into green, so they no longer kill their, kill their host. Well, this parasite, which was uh, being cut short because it killed its host, is now allowed to spread in that population. So if we cover the population with va a vaccine and prevent that host death, we are allowing those previously very dangerous uh, low fitness parasites to then circulate in the population. And that, that's the hi hypothesis that we're proposing here. So just to summarize what I'm going, going to tell you at the beginning of the talk so, so we don't get lost. First, I'm going to show you the data that, that, that virulence in the malaria parasite does have both benefits and costs to the parasite's fitness. Second, I want to uh, argue that and show you evidence that immunity, host immunity selects for higher parasite virulence. And thirdly, and it's not the same argument, I want to argue that at the population level, uh, that va widespread vaccination by increasing the general immunity in the population will lead to the evolution of a higher virulence. Number two and three are different. In number two, I'm just talking about the individual benefits of, um, and costs of immunity. And, thir and the third one is talking about the population level implications, uh, the evolutionary implications. So just to remind you quickly about the malaria parasite life cycle, they, the parasites replicate about eightfold every 48 hours in the host, and occasionally they spin off these sexuals, sexual forms, which are gametocytes, which are non-replicating, and they're at, at low density. So only about 1% of the red parasites, the asexual parasites, will convert to gametocytes, which when a mosquito bites, will be taken up into the mosquito's mid-gut, they'll go undergo meiosis, and then they'll get the, par the parasite will transmit to the next host that the mosquito bites in, a, in after about 14 days. Um, the problem for the parasite is that in exploiting its host by creating a lot of asexuals in order to produce as many sexual forms as it can to get to the mosquitoes, it causes disease. So sometimes it goes to the brain, causes cerebral malaria, more generally, it causes a lot of anemia because every 48 hours it's busting up one of its host's red blood cells. So the virulence comes from the asexual replication of the parasite. This is what it looks like. These are infected red blood cells. I'm sure you've all seen it before. This is a closer up uh, picture and the parasite has just burst out of its red blood cell and those eight progeny, the yellow things, are just about to reinfect a new red blood cell. Uh, that's what you can't see very well, but that sparkly thing over here is a gametocyte, the transmission form, which you can view under polarized light uh, under it using microscopy. Um, 
if the mosquito bites at that stage when there are those gametes circulating, it'll take them up, and then the parasite will form oocysts in the, in, on the, in the mid gut of the, of the um, mosquito, and then migrate to the salivary glands, and when mature, will infect a new host. So that's what it looks like, and those are the stages that we measure when we're measuring parasite fitness. This is what a course of an infection looks like. It's on a log scale. This is parasites per microliter on, um, by time. I've lost the axis here, but that's a 100-day infection. This is a human infection. And you can see that most of the acute part of the infection occurs within the first 10 days after emergence from the liver. And thereafter, you get a, a kind of a log linear decline in parasite density through time. The dotted lines are the are the uh, densities of gametocytes, the transmission stage forms through time, which also, also decrease in the log, lin log linear manner. And the peak of the disease occurs when parasite density is highest. And so if the host is going to die, they're going to die in this first 10-day period. After that, they're just experiencing chronic infection. So that's important for what I'm going to tell you next. Uh, so, okay, uh, so we measured these things in the mouse <coughs> model first. Obviously, you can't do the experiments in the humans. What we did was we took a whole lot of bunch of parasite clones, and uh, which were taken from the wild for a mouse malaria, and we measured the, the average transmissibility of that clone in a bunch of mice against its virulence on the x-axis. And what you can see is that the clones that were the most virulent were also the ones that produced the most gametocytes or transmission forms per unit time. So their transmission rate was higher in the virulent clones. Furthermore, they, the, para, the clones that were the most virulent were also the ones that had the longer infections. So the fitness of the parasite is the it's infection length multiplied by its transmissibility to give you the total lifetime transmission production. So there were st certainly benefits to virulence or the positive relationships between virulence and two components of fitness. What about the costs? Well, uh, the, it's, it was also true that the virulent parasites killed more of their hosts, and it turns, it turns out in, the, in this particular experiment that, that the parasite will lose 75% of its transmission on average um, if it kills its host. So there's a huge cost to the parasite if the host dies. What about humans? Well, as I showed you, uh, they were the, these, this is the infection course in the top uh, graph. We have a short infection and a less virulent infection, and in the, the bottom one we have a, more, a longer, more chronic one. These are data from patients infected with malaria deliberately to treat their neurosyphilis in uh, the early 1900s by giving them fever, malaria-induced fever. And so there are hundreds of these time course um, uh, data, and we can, measure, we can use that data to measure the total transmission output of the parasite in those different infections which is what I did, and these are the data, and there was a, a relationship between the total transmission output or the total number of gametocytes produced in an infection and the, some measure of virulence, or actually it was the maximum asexual parasite density. There's positive relationships to virulence in the human malaria parasite, um, and the costs, as I've shown you here, are very clear because all of the transmission occurs from after the peak parasitemia or acute disease. So if people are going to die, they die here, and that cuts out 100% of the transmission. So moving on to the second, it's for more virulent parasites. As I explained before, what happens with immunity is it protects the parasite from killing its host, and therefore it reduces the, the fitness costs to the parasite of virulence. There's a second benefit which is not necessary for our uh, hypothesis to work, but it, it turned out to be true in the mouse model that, um, that the relative uh, fitness advantage is even greater, of the virulent, most virulent clones is even greater in immunized hosts. They gain an extra step up because of their be better ability to be able to cope, uh, grow through an immunized host. And I'm not going to show you the data on that. But just concentrating on the protection from immunity. It's certainly true that immunity does cost the parasite a lot of fitness, so if we put the same clones of parasite in mice and, and measure them this time in semi-immune hosts, which is the pink things, we can see that 
um, immunity reduces transmissibility, infection length, and virulence, and that the changes are just, just follow the, the lines. Um, there's just a general shift down, which is related to the reduced replication rate of the parasite in the, in, in the immune host. But it's still true that the clones which were most virulent in naive hosts were the ones which were most virulent in, not in semi-immune hosts. So immunity reduces uh, fitness, but there's still an advantage to the parasite of being virulent when it hits that immune host. What about the costs? Well, as I said, the in an immune, immune host doesn't die so much, so it recover, it's protected from that cost. So the total fit lifetime output of the parasite in an immune host in pink is now recovered. So host death, um, the prevention of host death recovers some of that cost of, or reduces that cost, and so the benefits and costs change. What about in humans? Well, obviously we can't do the same experiment because we don't have different parasite clones and we can't stick them into people. But what I have done here is, is uh, taken data from a large longitudinal survey and instead of the axis being um, parasite uh, variability in, in virulence, it is now something related to age-acquired immunity, which is actually the average parasite density. And these, the, these, the single dots here are the average levels of parasite density and transmissibility in single age groups. So in the top, we have the children, which are the under one years old. These are the one to fours, and these are the adults. And you can see that across that spectrum of immunity, um, or parasite density, there's a positive relationship between um, transmiss transmissibility and virulence. So children have more, more transmission because they repli have higher replication of the parasite. Similarly, for infection length, you get these positive relationships. Longer infections are associated with higher parasite densities and higher virulence. And the costs are certainly there. It's the children who die. Uh, this, is the, this is the mortality. The children die much more than the adults, except when they get to old age and they're, they're dying of other causes. So the benefits and costs appear to be uh, present in the humans, in the human malaria parasite, but we <coughs> don't have the parasite genetic basis of that. We're just, um, these are just ecological relationships. The real question is what, how, much, how big is that cost? Is it enough to select the parasite in the field against virulence or for, for virulence? I've calculated the total um, fitness or transmission output from the different age groups of children and come up with this graph here. And then I've calculated what is the loss due to host death within that age class. And the x-axis is the percentage loss in the parasite's total fitness. And you can see that in the children, they're losing 4% of their fitness. That's across on, on average as a result of the host death. So that's a considerable fitness cost, and the important point here is that it's all happening in those young children. And you can get a, a fitness curve across uh, as a function of parasite density, and you can see um, that the, the fitness in the less than one-year-olds is not past the optimum level of fitness predicted by the curve. It seems that out there in the field, we don't have parasites circulating around which are suboptimal uh, sub in their virulence um, if, as me measured by fitness here. And this is the graph I showed you before. I want to emphasize this point that all the action is happening in the, in the young children. The young children die more. They're the, also the ones that transmit more. So this evolutionary balance between costs and benefits is happening in the young children. So the question then is, well, what hap would, would happen if we make all those babies immune? Which leads me on to uh, my next part of the talk, which is the population level consequences of making a, po um, uh, a, a population immune, either through vaccination or through, through other methods. So we published this paper in 2001, Troy's referred to it, where we used theoretical models which merged the evolutionary uh, models with epidemiological models to ask the question, what are the total population benefits if there is virulent evolution happening of vaccination? So you, on one hand, you'd argue vaccination would be great, you'd reduce, reduce disease, but the other, uh, 
but on the other hand, if there was a significant amount of virulence evolution, it might erode all those benefits that you gained through vaccination. So there's a population level question to be asked. As Troy uh, said, we model different types of vaccines. What I've been talking about so far is anti-growth rate vaccines, um, but we also model what we call anti-toxin vaccines, which are operating just to reduce host death, but don't modify the transmission or the, the replication rate. And we predicted that they select for higher virulence for the arguments I've given you. We also model these infection blocking vaccines what happens if you stop the parasite at the liver, liver stage, or what if you put everybody under bed nets or give them a transmission stage blocking vaccine and you stop it getting out of the host? And we predicted that they would either have no impact on virulence evolution or they would reduce it for reasons which I won't describe now. Similarly, we can make the same argument for drugs. Drugs stop people dying. They shorten the infection length. They're doing what an anti-growth rate <coughs> replication vaccine would, would do. And we would predict that they would select for higher virulence for those reasons. They're protecting the parasite against it killing its host. On the other hand, bed nets, which are very widely used now and which are really biting into malaria transmission at the moment, um, would be expected to have no or a desirable effect on virulence evolution. And it's very fortunate that bed nets uh, have been wide, are now very widely used. Okay, so this is uh, my, uh, just my final point. I'm now moving on to testing um, the basis of the virulence evolution hypothesis that grew out of the lab. I'm trying to test that in the field. Obviously, we can't do the vaccination experiment. A, we don't have a vaccine. B, if we had a vaccine, they wouldn't let us do it. C, it would be too late um, if we were to measure things post-vaccination, post even if it did work. Um, so I'm, try I'm proposing that we could do the, the natural test of this hypothesis has already been done. Parasites that are constantly under high immune pressure by being in a high transmission intensity environment will have a higher virulence than those that are in a low transmission environment because the uh, high transmission environment parasites are always hitting a semi-immune host. So on average, their immune selection pressure is higher. They're more often protected from killing their host. There are some data in the literature to, to suggest that there may be parasite differences in from high, medium, and low transmission environments. Uh, this is the proportion of malarias that come into hospital that go on to severe disease, and that was in all the syndromes that was higher in the high transmission environments, but there are many possible reasons for that. Uh, there's another d set of data which suggests that the case fatality rate in high transmission environments for people who come in with severe, severe malarial anemia, anemia is higher. But there are many confounding factors in that. So we don't have a good test of the hypothesis. So what I'm doing is taking a whole genome approach uh, to and using uh, trans, trans, uh, measuring the whole transcriptome of parasites that come from high, medium, and low transmission areas to see whether I can pick up whether there's differential adaptation in any of the genes of the parasite but between these populations and then working down from those differentially adapted genes from the transcriptome to see whether any of them are, are related to virulence. And so I've worked up the microarray techniques for parasites. Um, this, this will be the sort of experiment I'll do. I've got 50 parasites from each of the three times of populations, and I'll be doing um, whole transcriptome comparisons. I've already done the preliminary experiments to show that it works, um, where I've compared laboratory lines and field lines, and I've mapped what the adaptive genes are between um, for in vitro versus in vivo adaptation, and there are lots of very interesting genes there related to the expression of the parasites proteins on the on the surface of the red cell, as you would expect. And um, there were there were clear clear differences. So the technology works, and the variability is low enough for, for us to be able to go ahead with a big experiment and measure adaptive differences between populations. And it remains for me, for me to acknowledge Andrew Reid, who was uh, involved in much of the earlier um, mouse model work. Sylvain Gondon, who I did the theory with, and ZB Bolstek in Singapore, who is my um, collaborator on the microarray work, and Kevin Marsh um, at the Cambridge Wellcome Institute in, in Kenya, where I, where I work. Thank you.